Yes. Thank you. Okay. So let's flow. We talked about SN2. We talked about SN1. I've talked about E1 and E2. And we are continuing. Much of the lecture today will be E1 and some of SN1 because both E1 and SN1 go through formation of a carbocation. So we'll be comparing those two and then look at some of the energy profile graphs or diagrams and explain the transition states and continue from there. So we know that E1, SN1 need protic solvents. Okay, so the solvent will either play the role of a base or the solvent will play the role of, of, the role of a nucleophile. So if you're looking at SN1, if you're looking at the SN1, SN, uh, the solvent plays the role of a base. If you're looking at E1 mechanism, the solvent what did I say? If you're looking at SN1, the solvent plays the role of a nucleophile. Sorry. If you're looking at E1, the solvent will play the role of a base. Uh, a base. A base. So depending on what reaction you're going, the solvent will either be a base for elimination or a nucleophile for substitution. SN1 and E1, both of them compete because both of them go through formation of a carbocation intermediate and then after the carbocation intermediate you either make a substituted product or a pi bond for E1. Okay so let's see where the solvent is take, taking a role in the reaction. In other words let's define solvolysis. Solvolysis solvent breaking down of a substance using lysis is breaking down solve solvo solvent comes from the word solvent so you're doing a reaction which involves the solvent solvolysis so both sn1 and e1 will use the solvent either as a nucleophile or as a base so the solvent is involved in the reaction this is solvolysis uh, concept. So I said both SN1 and E1 will go through formation of a carbocation. So let's assume we are going SN1 this way. Living group leaves again, you're forming a carbocation. Check the carbocation is tertiary, no need for shifts. Then the solvent molecule can come on the second step as a nucleophile, in which case you are thinking SN1 substitution. It's not SN2 because SN2 will not form a carbocation. It's SN1. So the nucleophile attacks. Remember, the C plus is sp2 hybridized. So it's planar, trigonal flat, trigonal planar. So the nucleophile has an equal chance of attacking from the top or bottom, but because the Carbocation, as we discussed before, does not have three different groups. I don't expect racemic product. I don't expect RNS. So here we only show one product, assuming we are just attacking from the top, which will give you the same product if you attack from the bottom because it's a chiral product. So if you are attacking from the top, this is what you'll get, this molecule. But that's positively charged, so we need to deprotonate otherwise called proton transfer so there's a proton transfer and then you get your final product which happens to have the ether functional group okay the alcohol that took out the hyd the hydrogen by proton transfer becomes an alkoxonium OH becomes OH2. So probably this is what was taken out, was deprotonated. So that's substitution. You started with a BR, you end up with OCH3 attached. It's substitution, switching groups. In elimination, 
you'll do the same thing. The living group falls off, you get a Kaboka term. But now instead of the methanol attacking the C+, it takes out one of the beta hydrogens. This is a CH3, this is a CH3, and this is a CH3. So all of them are CH3. So we take out one of the beta hydrogens. Here the solvent is taking the role of a base. It's still solvolysis because the solvent is taking part uh, in the reaction. So we are taking out the beta hydrogen and then we are using the two electrons to make a double bond. So you, where you had CH3, now you have CH2. The other CH3 is at there. Okay, and again, the solvent that plays the role of a base accepted an extra hydrogen. So this probably could be this extra hydrogen. The oxygen gets a plus charge because you used its lone pair. That will be E1 because you are making a pi bond and because you are eliminating uh, two things. You're eliminating the beer. Okay, that one is common for both. So you're eliminating the beta hydrogen. Here the beta hydrogen stayed. Here you're eliminating it to make a double bond. The common step is formation of a carbocation for both SN1 and E1. This step is the same. Uh, nope, that's not the one. That's further away. Let's show the right step. Okay, so these two steps, these two are the same. Both of them are carbocations. That's a common step, which is formation of carbocation in SN1 and E1. That's why they compete. Now, can someone tell me which of these two processes will dominate and why? Unmute your mic. <clears throat> So the starting material has the same reactant methanol. Which one wins and why? So the key point here is SN1 dominates because there's more bond changes occurring in the second transition state of E1. And we're going to look at that. That's what I was looking for in the mechanism, but it wasn't very clear. And we'll look, it, we'll look, we'll look for it in the next slides. So in E1, the base is forming a new sigma bond with the hydrogen so let's see that so here that's the new sigma bond formed between the base the methanol and the hydrogen in other words it's this new sigma bond single bond in e1 okay and then it says so i've, say, I've shown you where the base is forming a new sigma bond this is sigma this sign here is sigma. The CH bond is breaking and a new pi bond is forming. We go back. So this CH bond, this CH bond right there is breaking. And we are forming a bond where it lands, which is this new pi bond. So that's a count of two. Then we go back forward. Whereas for SN1, bond formation only occurs between the nucleophile and the carbocation. So this is where we are forming uh, a bond right here between the nucleophile and the carbocation. So it's keeping one step right here. It's keeping one step. You, see, you only see one arrow here. You see two arrows. So there's more processes involved in E1 than in SN1 after the carbocation is formed. Can you see that? Two arrows right here. Here there's only one arrow. So there's more bond changes here in E1 than in SN1, which means E1 requires more energy for this step than SN1. So SN1 readily goes. There's nothing, there's less processes after carbocation is formed. There's only one instant bond formation, while here there are two bonds formed. There's one making the pi bond, and there's another one between the base 
and the beta hydrogen. So those two bond forming processes will require more energy as compared to SN1, which is only one bond forming process after the carbocation is formed. So that's why SN1 will dominate because there's less bond changes in SN1 than in E1, which has more bond changes occurring in the second transition state. Okay. To emphasize the point, if you're starting with this, when this falls off, you're going to get a carbocation. So the methanol will either play the role of a nucleophile, and that's how you're going to get this product, the nucleophile attacking the carbocation, or the methanol will play the role of a base, where the base will take out the beta hydrogen to make a double bond, which gives you that product. So SN1 reaction will always be followed by some E1 product. So this is E1 product. This is SN1 product. Okay. And like I said, you want to make a bond here. You want to break that bond. So this is to form. This is the transition state for E1. You need to form it there this one needs to break wants to break and then this one wants to form while in sn1 you only want have one instance of where a bond wants to form is this for every sn1 reaction it will yield a little percentage of e1 product correct <clears throat> So You'll always see some E1 unless unless there's there's another reaction where we, we are using we are doing SN1 on alcohols. In that case, you do you use a little bit excess of the uh, uh, you, you use a little bit excess of the acid to stop E1, but that's beyond beyond you, so uh, beyond your scope. So. For your case, you'll all just always know that your SN1 reactions will always give you minor product of E1 for your case. Okay, so SN1 always dominates. Some E1, yes. Okay. <clears throat> and the only time E1 wins is if you're dehydrating alcohols, which will be the later part of this lecture. We'll talk about that in the last 25 or 30 minutes. So you can see there's so much there's so much bond change, changes here. Bond wants to form between the so if this is playing the role of a base, you want to take out that hydrogen in the transition state. This bond wants to form. While this bond wants to break, you want to remove the beta hydrogen to break this bond. And then at the same time you want to make a pi bond. So there are three instances involving bond breaking on formation. But in SN1, there's only one instance. So you would expect that there's less barrier, there's less energy required, activation energy required for SN1 transition state. This is the E1 transition state. Now looking at the energy profile diagram that I was talking about, you definitely see that both SN1 and E1 will give you the same uh, carbocation intermediate. Okay, let me erase that and just draw it very well so you can understand what you are talking about. We are still referring to this reaction. So right here you have the three metals and a bromine. Bromine. When the bromine falls off, so the transition state will be here. The bromine bond one will want to break. So it weakens, so I'm drawing it with dashes. So once the bromine falls off, you get this tertiary carbocation. For both of them, will give you a common carbocation like we saw. Like we saw here, the carbocation is the same. Common step formation of carbocation in SN1 and E1. So they have the same carbocation. The difference is what happens after this. 
So with SN1, there's only one bond change. So the second step will give you a transition state which will have lower energy than the transition state for E1 because transition state of E1 has so many bond changes before the product is formed. Okay, so the activation energy, EA, is activation energy. So here, the activation energy, EA, for E1 is greater than the activation energy for SN1. Again, the reason being, there's so many bond changes in E1 transition state. The transition state here is common for both of them to make the carbocation. Transition state of SN1 route will have lower energy, which is this guy, compared to the transition state of E1, which will be somewhere here. All because of too many bond changes. So that's why most of the time SN1 will win over E1 in terms of rate and in terms of yield most of the time. There's only one instance where E1 will win, which is where alcohols are dehydrated with stronger acids like sulfuric acid. We'll, we'll talk about that in the last 30 minutes. So for the carbocation intermediate, yes. if, if it's not a three, um, if it's not a ter tertiary, tertiary. If it's not tertiary, that's when the hydride shift or the methyl... Yes, and in that case, you'll get an extra hump, which is common for both of them. If it's not okay. tertiary, both both SN1 and E1 will shift. The carbocations formed here, which would have been formed here, will be common for both to shift. And then only then will you get the, these other last transition states for E1 and SN1. So in that case, you'll see an extra transition state before these two guys. But it will be common for both SN1 and E1. Both, both carbocations for SN1 and E1 would shift. Hydrogen shift or metal shift. Okay. Okay, let's see the next graph. <clears throat> so I already described this reaction but instead of looking at effect of the solvent or asking ourselves who will win given that both of them are undergoing solvolysis let's now look at another factor temperature unfortunately some of the organic chemists think that temperature will always make E1 to dominate over SN1. It doesn't, it's not true. If you're increasing the temperature of a reaction, it affects both reaction pathways by fostering them. So if you increase the temperature, SN1 will be happy to be to increase even more. E1 will increase even more. Only that if you had 20%. Probably now you're going to see something like 30% of E1 and 70% of SN1 if you increase the temperature. You'll start seeing more of E1, but that doesn't mean that it's going to be uh, uh, extra enough to trump SN1. The reason why E1 will start showing up more of it is because you're giving a energy, you're giving energy which will help this process of bond breaking and bond forming. Okay, so increase in temperature does not make E1 win over SN1. Increase the, increasing the temperature will still produce the substituted product as the major. So SN1 will still win and only changes the ratio of E1 and SN1, which means You'll see, you'll see a little bit more of E1 than before and a little bit less of SN1. In very few cases, elevated temperature might favor E1. In fact, to me, I would say it's very rare. It's seldom. Very rare. Okay. But that said, all elimination reactions, whether E1 or E2, will require some heating because there's just too many bond-changing processes. 
okay so when you're heating the molecules are very happy the the chaos is increased in the flask the molecules are vibrant their motion is increased they gain kinetic energy they bump into each other the rate of reaction increases and then you see more of the product but that does not mean that e1 will win over sn1 just by increasing temperature so if in the test if you get a true and false question increase in temperature favors e1 over sn1 the answer is no sn1 was still gonna show up as the major product a little bit more of e1 will show up but it's, it's not gonna be favored over sn1 okay all right so let's see the tyro 9.4 sn1 e1 reaction so we are going to talk about regio chemistry selectivity of e1 producing the more substituted alkene so e1 will always want to produce the more substituted alkene that's the same rule that we discussed during the lecture last class more substituted alkene favored as a product Zaitsev rule Zaitsev's rule so let's discuss this Zaitsev rule as as pertains E1 so E1 mechanisms for formation of 2 methyl but one in from 2 bromo 2 methyl butane or 2 methyl but 2 in which is this guy so if you're starting with 2 methyl 2 2, me, 2 bromo 2 methyl butane which is this you might expect two products you'll expect either 2 methyl but 1 in and you'll expect 2 methyl but 1 in and 2 methyl but 2 in now remember here the molecule is highly symmetrical like you're starting with metal 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 but here you have metal metal and ethyl so you expect what we call regio isomers so we are trying to show how these two alkenes are possible so basically lose your bromine formation of carbocation and then now identify your bitter hydrogens that's a bitter carbon bitter and then bitter so if the solvent is decides to work as a base for e1 then you will take out one of these hydrogens from the metals or you'll take out one of the hydrogens from the ch2 so if you take out one of the hydrogens from one of these metals one and three take out the bitter hydrogen make a double bond you end up with this product okay now what if you take out one of these hydrogens from this carbon which is on on what's that carbon number on carbon three what if you take the hydrogen from this ch2 carbon number three of the longest chain so you show one of those hydrogens the met, uh, the solvent takes the role of a base takes out one of those two hydrogens you make a double bond. this time we did not touch the ch3s you make a double bond in between so you're gonna end up with this product now if you cannot see what's happening i'm gonna circle the groups so that ch3 is this ch3 okay let's circle the next one this ch3 right here is this ch3 right there or it's this guy right there okay so this is the red one and then i'm going to choose another color this ch3 right here is this ch3 right there and happens to be this one so this is just the same thing without the hydrogens so you can see that the hydrogen 
that was taken out left behind one hydrogen choosing another color which is the other color I've not used so one of these black hydrogen was taken out so one is left so it's gonna be somewhere here all right so this is CH2 CH3 is gonna be this group it's gonna be that group all right let's put the other one so this CH3 that lost a hydrogen is gonna be the CH2 that was left and then of course we have the other CH3 down there let me choose blue this CH3 right here is this CH3 right here and it's gonna be this one okay so you can see the difference this happens to be dye substituted product why we formed it by taking out the bitter hydrogen that's sitting on a less, the least substituted bitter carbon. And then this one right here is tri, tri substituted. Of course, because the alkene is surrounded by three carbons carbon, carbon, carbon. So it's tri substituted. This is dye because the alkene is surrounded by two carbons. This one there. This one there, and there's another one here. Your yeah, double bond is right here. So it's di substituted. Substitution means carbon groups drawn outside the double bond, outside the pi bond. So by Zaitsev rule, which states that the more substituted alkene is favored as a product, so to paraphrase it, I just paraphrased it, put it in simple words. Based on that, we know that this one will be the major out of the alkene products. So you get 32% and 8% of the dye substituted. 32% of the tri, 8% of the dye. Now I'm going to post a question to you. Why? What makes the rest of the percent? Because I have 32% of a dye bond here. I have 8% of a double bond there that makes 40 percent of the product from this reaction what is the 60 percent the sn1 product correct 60 percent will be sn1 product so these two guys combined together are still minor of the sn1 but inside the 40 percent the z7 minor will be the major minor so to speak or the tri substituted will be the most in amount in the 40% compared to the di substituted. So SN1 still wins. So we are just focusing on the byproduct E1. What is in the byproduct of E1? Inside the byproduct, the minor reaction E1, you get 32% of the Z product and 8% of the uh, Hoffman, we call it. Hoffman is a scientist who came back and criticized Zaitsev and told him it's not always true according to your law, which is this law. Sometimes you get opposites. So you get Hoffman product, which is otherwise called anti Zaitsev product which is just the least substituted of the two. Okay, so I think I've thoroughly explained that one uh, evidenced by the colors on the board. So you understand that whenever you're doing E1, the major of the E1, whether the E1 is the major or minor of the reaction route, the major of the E1 will always be the z product. The more substituted double bond will be favored, which means it has more alkyl groups across the double bond will be favored. All right, moving on. So now let's discuss about these two products. 
Remember, I called this die substituted, and I called it the Hoffman product. Of course, it's the anti Zaitsev product. This one is try substituted. Out of the two, is the most substituted, so we call it a Zaitsev product. So here we are showing their pathway. So if I was to show SN1 here, this is how I'll trace it. It's going to follow the same trend as E1 started because both E1 and SN1 will have a common carbocation. Once you get your common carbocation, which would be let's see let's see i think trying to check to make sure we have the thing, same thing so the kaboka town for this one once this falls off the kaboka town will look like this okay and then this one will react to make those three products so the kaboka town will be here it's already tertiary no need for shifting. I think there's a problem somewhere. Let me see. There's a misdrawing on this question. Why is the misdrawing? Yeah, this method is not supposed to be there. That's a correction. So here we have hydrogens, not methods. We have two hydrogens. There should be two hydrogens. That's a misdrawing. So the Kaboka town will look like this. There's two hydrogens on there. For both of them, the Kaboka town will look like that. And then from here, you'll either go SN1 or E1. These green and blue are for E1 minus. So SN1 would have traced right below here with a very low activation energy to give you the major to give you the major product which is this this is this is sn1 and like you said it's gonna be 60 percent so i'll draw it here you see it has low energy which means it's the major that will be the sn1 product this will be e1 that gives you that and this pathway will be e1 that gives you that. Now you're asking, how are you going to test all this mess? If you're given a graph and you're given three products, I would ask you to match the products to the right pathway. Then you need to know SN1 needs to be the most stable, which means it's going to be the major, and then the Z7 will follow, and then the anti Z7 will be the one with the highest activation energy, because the SN1 will have less activation energy. So that would be that would be an example of a question that you'll get from such a slide. Match from this, this is the reaction gives you a mixture of products. Match the products to the correct um, the correct curve or correct plotting or the correct lines. Then you'll know SN1 should be the most stable, followed by E1, followed by E1. I mean, followed by E1 Z7, followed by E1 anti z which would be the least product out of the three. Do you have a question on that? Okay, I've given you my expectations. So let's see what's next. So identify the major and minor E1 products formed in the following SN1 reaction. Someone tell me what will one be? It's definitely E1 because you're making double bonds. Is this major? one going to be the major or not? Major. Correct. And the reason is you look at the double bond, it's connected to three carbons. So which means this pi bond is tri-substituted. 
based on these rule, the more substituted and the reaction where you're forming double bonds, the more substituted double bond would be the major. So this is twice substitute, substituted. Here I see the baby hydrogens. Those hydrogens are not substitu substituents. The double bond is bonded to two carbons directly. So this is disub. So obviously this will be the major E1. Not the major overall. Obviously the major overall will be SN1. This will be the major E1. This will be the minor of the minor product, minor reaction E1. So, um, so number one would be the major E1. Why? It's tri substituted. Number two will be the minor E1. Why? Is the least substituted out of the two pair, out of the two. All right. Is someone still floating or are we on the same page? If you have a question, I give you five seconds and mute and ask. Okay, great. What's coming up? Now, this is where E1 will always win. E1 will always win in dehydration of alcohols. In fact, I should say that's the only time. Only time E1 wins because We've, we've not been cheering for E1, but this is the time to cheer for it because it's going to be, it's going to win. Actually, I would expect it should, it should be the only one, no SN1. So whenever you're dehydrating alcohols, you're losing, you're losing elements of water. You're losing elements of H2O. from the molecule. What are elements of H2O? Obviously you have two hydrogen and oxygen. So looking at the conditions where E1 wins, you heat up the reaction, probably a tertiary and secondary alcohol in concentrated acids, in concentrated, let me say in bulky, it has to be bulky in bulky concentrated acids such as sulfuric acid and phosphoric acid. I call them bulky because if you compare these two guys to HCl or HBr or even HI, look at the structures, very small. Here you have hydrogen, sulfur, four oxygens. The Lewis structure for this guy is huge. So I call it bulky. And you want it to be bulky so that the conjugate bases from these acids will not play the role of a nucleophile, which will give SN1. That's why we need them bulky. If you use this type of acids with primary, secondary, tertiary alcohol, you're going to get SN1. Especially with secondary, tertiary, you get SN1. So to avoid SN1, we use bulky, concentrated, strong acids, such as sulfuric acid or phosphoric acids. Those will be the two that you'll see in this course that will be used to dehydrate alcohols. It must be concentrated. So you see, it says here 85% of sulfuric acid, which means 85% is the acid, 15% is the water. So it's very concentrated. Like this guy does not joke around. If it drops on your hand, it's just going to chew up your flesh. So now, you have a tertiary alcohol. Obviously, that's an alpha carbon. These are beta carbons. Okay. Why are we happy about tertiary? We know that if the OH is lost, we're going to get a tertiary carbocation. And E1 follows that profile. All right. So when this is lost, somehow... A bit of hydrogen will be lost, either that or that. You're going to get two products. This one is anti-Z7. Why? 
again it's di substituted the double bond directly bonded to two carbons here the double bond directly bonded to three carbons so this is tricep okay here if H is lost and one of the hydrogens obviously those are elements of water if you lose H and OH you are losing water if you are losing water you are dehydrating so if H and OH is lost probably you're gonna make a double bond either there or here so you'll get this which will come from this hydrogen and OH lost that's mono mono substituted this is di substituted and not, not only that it's cis and then this is di substituted still and one would call it trans or e this is cis or z this is trans or e this turns this both the the second and the third both of them are di substituted but this one the b groups are further away across the double bond there's no sterics okay but here the ch3s are on one side we talked about this before they crowd that makes the c's less stable than the trans di substituted of course the the mono will be the least based on Z rule. Okay, so uh, why did it skip? Okay, so uh, keep in mind that dehydration is loss of elements of water. It's E1, so first you form a Kaboka town and then you have a choice of either taking out the most substituted beta hydrogen or the least substituted beta hydrogen. You get mixtures based on Z rule. The one, the double bond that's more substituted and least sterically hindered will be the major. So now let's look at the mechanism. How does this dehydration happen? We talked about living groups and I remember emphasizing that a good living group must form a weak base. When OH falls off, if this OH has to fall off, just like remember how we did with the bromine bromine we just lost it that was possible because when bromine leaves it gives you a weak base it's big in size and bromine is electronegative very electronegative it's it's a halogen but in this case if you were to lose oh as it is you get oh minus that's a very strong base in fact we use it for e2 reactions so this is a poor leaving group so then how do we make it a good living group? The reaction starts by protonation. So let me erase this arrow because OH is not gonna leave yet. So we have to help OH be a good living group. Instead of leaving as OH minus, we would rather have it leave as water. So this is an acid, the Lewis structure of sulfuric acid, and we knew it's concentrated. So an acid is a proton donor, so we use the lone pair on oxygen to accept the hydrogen. Of course, now this will play the role of a base, accepting a, a, a proton from the acid. So you use the lone pair on oxygen, then you're going to get a plus sign on it. Okay. Now, the rest of the Lewis structure of the acid will fall off. As this structure so this is a living group and it's a good living group from the structure of the acid because it's resonance stabilized once you get these two products the water now can leave so you lose loss of a living group which happens to be water once you help OH become a good living group you lose the H2O, you get a Kaboka town, it happens to be a tertiary. No need for shifts. Now, remember the conjugate base that was lost 
during the first step can be used as a base to take out this bitter hydrogen in your carbocation. You know, this is bitter. That's bitter hydrogen, bitter carbon, bitter hydrogens, and these are bitter. So we choose, these are metals. So we choose one of these. Let's take that upper one and take that hydrogen out, make a double bond. You're going to end up with this product because this CH2 is part of this. This CH3 right here is this CH3 right here. And obviously, you have CH2, CH3. Let me circle it twice. That one is this part right here. So without showing the hydrogens, you end up with this structure, which is di-substituted. The conjugate base took out the bitter hydrogen. You recycled back your sulfuric acid that you started with on step one. So you don't need much of the acid because it keeps on being regenerated. And then that sulfuric acid will react with another alcohol until the process is done. Here, the sulfuric acid is recycled. Okay, so we've shown how to make one of the one of the double bonds, one of the pi bonds, uh, pen. So the sulfuric acid is recycled. Recycled, let's just say it's recycled. Okay, so now what if we choose to take out this bitter hydrogen from the carbocation intermediate? That's what's happening here. Taking out the hydrogen from the neighboring CH2. Okay, now this time we are not touching the other bitter carbons. So use the conjugate base from your step one, this conjugate base. Use it as a base to do the proton transfer. Take out the hydrogen, make a double bond you get this double bond. So this CH3 right here is this CH3 right there. You had a CH2. You lost one of the bitter hydrogen. You're left with CH as you made your double bond. So this is tri-sub. And of course, it's going to be the major 90% of that, 10% of this. So this is 90, that's 10. So overall, you lost your H2O. On this second step when the H2O fell off and that's evidence of dehydration. So remember again the first step must be to make alcohol a better living group because OH is not a good living group. Do you have a question on what I explained? Again the video is recorded I'll post it under chapter 9 on Muru you can play it back slowly. Do you have a question? <coughs> Right. E1 dominates. So far, I've not talked about SN1 because, again, this is so bulky. You're not going to use this to attack the carbocation. Instead, the big conjugate base is used to deprotonate the bitter hydrogen, not to attack. Like one would have expected because it's negatively charged, one would have expected that this guy should attack the carbocation. That does not happen. Why? This conjugate base right here is bulky. And that's why we use bulky acids like phosphoric acid and sulfuric acids because their conjugate bases don't play the role of a nucleophile. They play the role of a base. And that's how SN1 does not show up. Only E1 shows up. SN1 will show up if this green arrow was followed. Again, one more time, I'm calling for a question. Five seconds and mute and ask if not we proceed with chemistry. <coughs> All right, so let's see what's next. Someone answered the question what will be the major product in the following dehydration reaction? Again, you should be thinking E1 because this is a tertiary alcohol. Unmute your mic, tell me who is the major. 
followed by two. Who? I agree. Two will be the major. Where's my pen? So two will be the major followed by one. Three might not show up because this is an SN1 implied product. But these two guys are E1s. So not common. So we, we don't even care about that. So this would be E1 minor. This would be E1 major. Here, as in one does not show up. Because again, we are using bulky strong acid. So it's not going to, the conjugate base from the acid will not play the role of a nucleophile to do SN1. Okay. That does not happen. So I agree. Two is going to be the major product overall. It happens to be E1. SN1 does not show up. I've explained why. Okay, let's see what's coming up. Someone tell me who, who will be the major here. Don't look down at the answer. Just tell me who will be the major there. Look up. Who will be the major? One, two, or three? Two. Again, it's two. It's tetra substituted. You see? The alkene is surrounded by four groups. So it's tetra substituted. This one is mono because the alkene is only bonded to one carbon, even though that carbon has so many other carbons. And then this one is di. The double bond is bonded to two other carbons. So now let's see, let's show why two is the major. One would expect shifts. So remember, we said OH is not a good living group. So someone has to help it leave us water. To do that, the alcohol plays the role of a base. And then the acid plays the role of an acid by donating a proton. So now you have hydronium. This now can leave. So you get, when this leaves, you get that plus H2O. Notice that this is a secondary carbocation. The C plus is bonded to two other carbons. You have a carbon here and a carbon there. So it's secondary. So if it's secondary, inspect to see if you can do shifts and the answer is yes i can do a metal shift from the neighboring carbon that's more substituted in so doing i'm getting two metals that were left behind and this ch3 that was moved is now right here with the other ch3 the plus sign will be here so now this is a tertiary obtained from secondary by the process called metal shift so now the tertiary will move forward to do e1 so notice that you have a hydrogen here so as you did the protonation in the first stage when the alcohol played the role of a base to take out this the byproduct will be the conjugate base of the acid again the conjugate base of the acid comes back to deprotonate this red hydrogen to give the major product. So this is the conjugate base that fell off in the beginning. It comes back to take out the hydrogen and then you make a double bond and that's how this product is formed. So from this process, let me just track my arrow. You get that product. But that's not the only product. If you bring the same tertiary carbocation 
if you bring the same tertiary carbocation so let's say i'm gonna flip it over it's just the same thing anyway if you do that and now instead of taking the more the hydrogen from a more substituted bitter carbon let's take it from the outside so let's take out this guy using the same conjugate base that came from the acid then you're going to get you're going to get the anti zsf product otherwise called the hoffman product which is this guy and how are we getting this this comes from the secondary carbocation it comes from the secondary carbocation that the one that you have here before rearrangement so let's say the secondary carbocation decides so the secondary carbocation decides to react with the conjugate base to make the double bond before the shift. So again, the conjugate base forgets to wait for the shift. So instead, it just goes ahead and attacks the secondary carbocation. Then you get that. Notice that this is 3%. Why? Because it came from the minor carbocation intermediate. This is 33%. It's more than the 3% because this came from a tertiary, while this one came from a secondary. And then this is the most abundant because it came from the tertiary, but at the same time, you have it more substituted as substituted with four alkyl groups across the double bond. So it's tetrasub. So that's why you see it at 64%. This is the 3%. Both these two guys came from the major tertiary carbocation. Usually, major products come from the major, major carbocation intermediate. And then the minor comes from the minor carbocation intermediate, which is secondary in this case. You get 3%. Do you have a question on that part? I've explained the product distribution and the mechanism. <coughs> Okay, so what the transition state shown here is just trying to show you how the base is trying to take out the hydrogen. So this bond wants to form, this this wants to break, and you want to form another bond there, the double bond. That's how you make this double bond right here. Here we are showing how the metal shifts. This is the transition state for metal shift. I, I think, you know, I told you I'm not going to test you I'm not going to ask you to do the transition states. That's why I bypassed the transition states and I'm just explaining what happens overall without going through the transition states. Okay. Uh, well, looks like that was the last one. Do you have a question on that part or no? No question. Okay, so let me finish up with what's left. I think it was just few slides on this part. Let me see what's there, if, it's, if it can be done now or not. Yeah, so I've just described this slide. This is just where we just stopped. Let's see the next one. So this is showing the profile, energy profile, and it looks crazy. So all is just showing uh, again, I told you if I bring such a question, I'll ask you to identify the product distribution. Uh, and you should be able to answer such a question if it comes. Because all I'll need you to show me is that which one has the highest energy, which one has the least energy in this energy profile diagram. So if you do the dehydration of that alcohol, you're going to get these three products. Again, the, the disguised question is which is the major? So that will be minor one. This will be minor two. So this one will have the highest energy. Why? Because the carbocation intermediate is secondary and you're going to have a high activation energy to form it. And then this will follow. The one that's going to be more stable is the one that's tetra substituted. That's the main information I want you to know here. So don't be scared about what's shown on here. This is disub, 
and it came from tertiary that is substituted, substituted from tertiary carbocation tetra substituted from tertiary carbocation remember all these are E1s okay and then this is mono mono substituted from secondary carbocation so it's the most unstable most unlikely secondary carbo okay let's see it pen is not writing so this is secondary from this is the minor from secondary carbo cation okay so you just need to identify which profile is for which compound someone answered that question what is the major organic product formed from the dehydration reaction one one someone is saying one let me see is it one it should be so you know OH should fall off after it's protonated and then this is secondary so it's gonna do a hydrogen shift the hydrogen is there it's just not shown so after the hydrogen shift you get a plus charge there and now you have to make the more substituted alkene to do that find the bitter carbon that is more substituted that's what's gonna give you the hydrogen to take out so your conjugate base will just take out this hydrogen and that's how you get one remember this conjugate base is what's left of the acid after protonating the OH according to the mechanism uh, that we've been doing so I agree the answer is one this is trisub tituted according to this rule this is monosub uh, this is disub this is disub you see even without going through the mechanism just relate the diagram to the backbone of the structure of the starting material if you look for the one that's more substituted you'll always be right so the answer is one okay um, uh, let's see uh, not to worry about that it has human projection that's not tested here we will be the major identify the major and the minor which one will be the major two y2 and not one both of them are tri substituted um uh the phs are the larger groups and they have less sterics because they're trans yes remember for those who don't know ph is a big benzene ring popping out of the structure so here you have the big benzene rings together even though the double bond is tri substituted you have three carbons three carbons across both of them so both of them are tri substituted but now here you're looking at sterics so in other words this one will be a z and this one will be the e it's most comfortable because the big groups are away let's stop there